All right, welcome everybody to the Corona Classroom. We're going to get started with period eight now. So this is honestly probably one of my favorite periods. So I'm pretty bummed that uh, we're going to be doing it online. But uh, a lot of interesting stuff in this period. Uh, we're going to be starting with like post war culture and getting into the cold war and then there's gonna be lots of social changes and vietnam and you know a whole lot of stuff is going to happen between 1945 and 1980 it's not necessarily a lot of years we've covered more years before but it is a lot of information so i really really want to stress that um, in addition to these videos, please do your readings. Um, stay track with your, or stay on track with your syllabus reading guide. Um, those should still be the same. I don't plan on altering that schedule much. Um, make sure you're reading your chapters. Make sure you're uh, reading in your AMSCO book, getting your IDs done. Uh, don't let any of that stuff sneak up on you. And yes, we still have IDs. Don't even try it. Um, we're starting with chapter 35 um, so that will probably be about three ish videos um, and then we'll get into the next chapter here so um, this period like I said coming out of World War two that's really gonna be you know context is so important I know we don't like always like contextualization but context is so important because everything that we're gonna see happening here in these early years coming out of the war um, a lot of it has like direct um, you know it's it's a direct consequence of what happened in the years before and you can't you couldn't have really understood how it happened if you didn't have all of that context in your head so coming out of the war um really even before the war was technically over we were already trying to decide what our next moves were and so we had multiple conferences uh us and the allies which was pretty much you know the united states great britain and russia the first time we met was at the Potsdam Conference. Um, it was obviously Joseph Stalin, um, FDR for the United States, and Winston Churchill for Great Britain. Not a lot of promises were made with what we intended to do with Europe and the rest of the world after the war was over. Um, and most of that came down to the fact that us and Great Britain thought we should have free elections and that all these countries that we were sort of going to be piecing back together, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, all these places, should be able to have free elections and elect their own leaders. Not exactly something that you're down for if you're Joseph Stalin and you're a totalitarian dictator, right? So no one really wanted to put a lot of pressure on Stalin to make promises and commitments because they still needed him. It was, the war wasn't quite over yet when this meeting took place. It took place. It was about February of 1945 and he was still needed to finish the invasion in Berlin and then eventually invade in Japan. So they just sort of made some vague plans. The final decisions came in July of 1945 when they met at Yalta, and when they met at Yalta, it was a, it was a very different experience. Obviously, Stalin was still there, but FDR had died by this point, so President Harry Truman was representing the United States instead, and Winston Churchill was no longer the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Clement Attlee was, so a very different dynamic um, with you know, th three very different, very different guys, two of which are very new to the situation, right? You know, uh, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill had been through all of this with Stalin the whole time. Um, but, tr you know, Harry Truman and uh, Clement Adelaide, they have, they have no relationship with Joseph Stalin. So um, ultimately what they decided was that, you know, let's learn from our mistakes. If we look back, how did World War I get us to World War II? What were the mistakes we made in the middle? Uh, one mistake they felt they made in the middle was allowing Germany to reconstruct itself. They didn't feel like Germany could be trusted with that. Sort of this, like the South at the end of the uh, Civil War. Like they couldn't be responsible for treating African Americans as equal citizens. So um, the North had to sort of monitor that reconstruction process. And that's basically what's going to happen here. Is it, Or I guess you could say that was the plan. Um, essentially, Germany is going to be divided into originally what was four zones, but pretty quickly Great Britain and France will turn their zones over to the United States because they couldn't handle 
um, their reconstruction process along with monitoring the reconstruction process of Germany. So um, the entire western side of Germany and the other parts of western Europe are going to be monitored by the United States moving forward. And we're going to help them set up a government. We're going to help them have free elections. West, or sorry, East Germany on the other side on the other hand, and um, other countries on, in Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, you can see these countries here on the right side of the black line, they're going to be under the control and occupation of the Soviet Union. They will not be having free elections. <laughs> they will basically be having, um, you know, communism shoved in their face, and um, they will have uh, puppet government set up. Now, as for the capital of Germany, Berlin, you know, Berlin isn't just the capital of Germany. It is a very important global city in terms of trade and commerce and things like that. Um, I mean, think about it. Washington, D.C. is our capital, but globally, it's not a super important city. You know, um, if you're thinking of the most important global cities in the United States, New York probably comes to your mind. So imagine if New York was New York, but it was also the capital of the United States, and it, or if it had stayed the capital. That's sort of how important Berlin was. And the Soviet Union didn't trust us to have it. We didn't trust them to have it. So instead of deciding to assign... Uh, a second capital, maybe on our side, like Frankfurt or Munich or something, they decide to instead split that city in half. And so West Berlin, which is in East Germany, if you can look on this map here, if you see this little red dot, that's Berlin. It's way into East Germany. Um, West Berlin will be under the control of the United States, and East Berlin will be under the control of the Soviet Union. A pretty weird situation. And as for, like I said, the, with the rest of Europe, we just keep drawing the line all the way down. And we, uh, Winston Churchill, later in a speech, will nickname that line the Iron Curtain. Um, it wasn't a it wasn't a physical barrier for a majority of Europe. There were parts that were fenced and were a physical barrier, but this was a literal and metaphorical division now between us and the way we think government should run and the way we think the world should be run and the Soviet Union and their interpretation of all of those questions. And moving forward over the next essentially like 60 years, 50 to 60 years, we're going to be trying to rectify these two very different interpretations of what should have happened after um World War Two and and you know putting this firm line between us was definitely not a good idea kind of like the Missouri compromise line um, if you remember when we were um, way back in like period I don't know five or something or no I guess that would be period four um, when we drew a literal line between north and south it just further entrenches those divisions and that's exactly what was happening here we were you know, it's more than symbolic. It's a literal division between our side of the world and their side of the world. So our relationship from World War II, dead and gone, we're moving in now. Um, and moving forward, the United States is the most powerful country in the world, rivaled only by the Soviet Union. We are the wealthiest country in the world. We're the most industrial country in the world. We're the largest creditor in the world. We have the highest standard of living in the world. And we really wanted to embrace that global role. You know, we're a fairly young country and we have finally made it not only onto the big stage, but like we're running the show now, you know, the, t the student has become the teacher type of situation. And we wanted to learn from past mistakes and try to look like this, you know, guiding light and savior for all of the world's problems. So um, we'll do that in a variety of ways. Pretty quickly, um, in 1945, uh, one of the other mistakes we looked to rectify was the League of Nations uh, by obviously disbanding the League of Nations and forming a true intergovernmental organization designed to, um, you know, prevent global crises. Um, and that would be the United Nations or the UN, um, the 
official charter for the UN was signed in San Francisco, and then their headquarters was set up in New York City. If you've ever been to New York and you've seen the UN, um, you might not have even known you saw it, but they have a massive sort of semicircle of flags out front of the building um, representing every country that is a member of the United Nations. And um, in the United Nations, every country is not equal. That's a very important piece of it, you know. Um, and it kind of makes sense. It doesn't make sense that um, a country like Finland might have the same say in global um in a global crisis as the United States. Um, I'm not saying that because, you know, like I'm in the United States and I want us to have the most power. I'm saying that because we have way more people than Finland and we would be funding, you know, whatever the crisis would be, without a doubt, the United States would be funding a much bigger portion of the bill than Finland ever would. So it makes sense that you, when you share a larger piece of the pie, more of the burden, that you would also sort of get more of the reward in the end. So the UN was created with the intention of being the League of Nations that the League of Nations never was. Um, have they truly fulfilled that role? I'm not going to totally impart all of my personal biases and beliefs on you today, maybe another time. Um, but nevertheless, that was the purpose of the United Nations. They also created a universal declaration of human rights pretty early in light of the Holocaust. And, um, not, it's not necessarily a list of like laws of what, um, the world should be following in terms of what human rights are. Um, but it's definitely a sort of a set of like, um, I guess, suggestions. Um, they also established the Security Council with five uh, permanent members. So these five members have sort of what's called like a super vote. Any of these members can, with one vote, block any issue on the Security Council, uh, and their seats never rotate, regardless of what happens, you know, in history. These five countries will always maintain a seat on the Security Council, and you can probably guess what five they are. Us, Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and China. Those five countries maintain permanent seats on the Security Council. The next thing we do in an effort to try to restore the economy in 1948, we sign the GATT, the G-A-T-T, -T, or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, um, which is, you know, sort of exactly like what it sounds. It's an agreement to try and do what to tariffs and trade? Well, cut tariffs and increase trade. After the Great Depression, or I guess even, you know, really before the Depression was in full swing, after Holly Smoot, when um, trade had basically completely ceased, and then because of the war, trade was pretty much not happening other than, like, for war purposes. Um, in an effort to rebuild the economies of Europe and Asia, trade is going to be a, a key piece to that. And we can't trade if everyone's keeping tariffs high, which discourages trade. So we all signed the GATT agreeing to limit our tariffs and try to grow trade. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to form the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. While we were the largest creditor in the world, we know that that's not necessarily a good thing. We were the largest creditor in the world coming out of World War One as well. And when we hit our next financial crisis, we brought the rest of the world into it as well. So we're still trying to learn from our mistakes. We use this opportunity to create these two entities to where, you know, you don't necessarily have to come to the United States for your loans. You can go to the World Bank. Maybe the U.S. doesn't have to always front money for certain things. It can come out of the International Monetary Fund. So it sort of creates this, like, extra uh, piece of, um, I guess it sort of un unloads some of the financial burden that we have by being such, like, an economic uh, powerhouse. I'm sure Thomas Jefferson was rolling in his grave at the time, something he never would have ever wanted to be a part of. All right, Harry Truman, Harry S. Truman, here we go. Getting into President Truman's um, administration here, right now I'm just going to focus on his um, foreign policy um, in terms of Cold War and stuff, and I'll get into his domestic policy, the fair deal, um, in a different video. But um, moving into this post-war era, our foreign policy can really be summed up in one word, and that word is containment. What are we containing? Communism. Where is communism? Russia. 
and that's where we want to keep it, right? We don't want it to go anywhere else. If it does go somewhere else, that's going to freak us out and it's going to make us do stuff because um, we always want to keep communism where it is. We don't want to grow it. Um, so if there's ever a question of why did the United States do this thing they did in foreign policy, the answer 99% of the time from 1945 to 1989 is to prevent the spread of communism. Um, in 1947, in trying to rebuild a lot of these countries, you know, coming out of World War One, all these countries in Europe were in a really precarious situation, desperate times, and these psycho leaders took hold. We don't want that, right? We don't want communism taking hold in these poor countries because they're in a desperate place after the war. So in 1947, Truman issues the Truman Doctrine, which basically said that the United States would aid any country needing help defending themselves against Against communism and trying to prevent a communist revolution in their country. At the time, we were specifically talking about two places, Greece and Turkey, both of which were having financial problems after the war and had a growing communist party and a threatening communist revolution you know, potentially about to take place. We didn't want that to happen, so we issued the Truman Doctrine authorizing 400 million dollars for us to send aid to both Greece and Turkey to help them prevent communism from taking um, you know too much power in their country we you can think of it like we spent 400 million dollars on greasy Turkey that's how I always remember it. Um, and if we are helping to rebuild these economies you know it's not just Greece and Turkey it's everyone and if we're gonna tell you we don't want you to have communism we got to tell you what we do want you to have capitalism. So in 1947, we put together this plan called the Marshall Plan, which was uh, basically how we're going to fix the economy of Europe. And so what we decided was to host this conference, which would, which everyone in Europe would be invited, um, come to our conference, which would sort of be like a class, like a tutorial. If you come to the conference, take our class on how to rebuild your economy, then we will give you your share of $20 billion. That's how much money we're going to allot to this. We've got these billions. You come to the class. You take our capitalism is awesome 101 class and we'll cut you a check that's literally all you have to do um, so of course everyone is gonna want to do this right all of Western Europe quickly signs up Eastern Europe though they really need this money right Eastern Europe is super devastated after after World War uh, two but Eastern Europe is not under the control of the United States they are puppet governments for the Soviet Union of course Joseph Stalin is not going to want his puppet governments to attend a capitalism is awesome class and to take American money no way so he basically calls every one of these countries and says you know like I'll murder all of you if you go to this class one country actually did, and it was uh, Yugoslavia. The leader of Yugoslavia, Tito, was like, I'm sorry, Joe, I need the money. And he went to the class anyway, and, you know, Tito didn't fare too well after that. But that's all I'll say on the matter. But nevertheless, we're trying to step into that role of helping Europe get back up on their feet, taking a lot of that responsibility and authority and being this, like, global leader. Now, that's not always going to go well, right? Like, the more powerful we get, the more, le I, guess you're, I guess you would say, the less powerful the Soviet Union feels. And the same way we're trying to be a global leader, they're trying to be a global leader. But you can't have two number ones, right? So, um, in 1948, we were looking to, uh, you know, print a new currency for West Germany, um, which would include West Berlin. You know, at the time, their country, their, their currency still had Hitler on it. That's no good. And it's also super inflated. So we basically decide that we need to scrap it. We need to throw the entire currency away, print a brand new currency, you know, lower the rate of it to get it stable again. And we, we put like a deadline on it, you know, like turn your money into your bank by this day and the bank will issue your new currency. But if we put West Germany and West Berlin on one currency and East Germany and East Berlin on another currency, that's super confusing and it would probably limit trade between the two. So we call Khrushchev, or not Khrushchev, wrong, 
Soviet leader, we call Stalin and we basically say, hey man, we've got the currency, we'll, we'll, we'll print enough for you, just tell us how much you want, um, here's the date that we're going to do it, you know, like we're going to bring it, we can literally deliver it to whoever you want, like we'll do all the work, just tell us if you're down. And all Stalin hears in that entire conversation is capitalist conspiracy to undermine communist authority. And the same way, you know, we're trying to prevent the spread of communism, he's trying to prevent the spread of capitalism. So on the day that we show up to deliver our new currency to West Berlin, all the roads are shut down, and all the canals are shut down, and all the bridges are shut down, and there's no way to get into our side of the city, and no way for anyone to get out of that side of the city. Everyone is trapped. Stalin has put barricades all around the entire city, because remember, while West Berlin is under our control, it is completely surrounded by East Germany, which is all Stalin. You see that political cartoon there of the big Russian bear hugging Berlin. Um, so we are not about to be undone just because we can't get into Berlin doesn't mean they're not going to get what they need. You know, it's not just the currency, it's medical supplies, it's food, it's everything. So at that point, Truman authorizes an airlift and this airlift will happen for over a year. We will have to airlift supplies into Berlin. We'll airlift the currency, they'll airlift food, medicine, anything that the city needs um, with parachute uh, drop-offs. If you see this picture down here at the bottom with the kids all up on the hill it's because sometimes the pilots would drop like candy in the parachutes and like send candy down to the kids which is really cute um so like i said we're not letting ourselves get outsmarted by uh stalin but we can see here that this is not the relationship we had during world war ii you know it's barely been three years since we were supposedly working together and now we have there's like no communication and you know tensions are constantly increasing the next year in 1949 a communist revolution takes place in china that is the worst thing that could have happened in our mind because our whole thing prevent the spread of the communism well it's spreading not what we want um, so we obviously, you know, this is terrifying, nothing we want to be a part of. So in an effort to further, you know, defend ourselves and try and, uh, boost up our ability to fight the Soviet Union, if that were to happen, we decide to start making some new alliances. So in 1949, we uh, form something called NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which was us and other European countries, you know, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, basically all signing like a formal alliance and, you know, uh, all dedicated to each other's prosperity, blah, 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 blah. It was like us and Great Britain and France and everyone else. Um, and so at that point, you know, Russia, though, they're not invited. This is pretty much like a no commies allowed club. And, you know, Russia being a commie, you can't be in our club. So they got to make their own club. Um, and so they create one called the Warsaw Pact. Now, who would want to be in a commie club? That doesn't sound fun at all. Um, Stalin calls up all these, you know, Eastern European countries, Poland, the Ukraine. Well, that doesn't really exist at this point. But, you know, Bulgaria, Romania, it calls them all up. He's like, hey, you want to be my commie club? And they're like, no, I don't want to be in, I don't want to do that. It sounds terrible. And he's like, too bad you are, because what I say is what goes. So he <laughs> essentially forces all these countries to sign the Warsaw Pact and um, be a part of his club. So now he has one and we have one, so we're even. But that's not good. We can't be even. We need to be winners here. So we create another club. This one is called CETO, S-E-A-T-O, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. It is a treaty with us and Great Britain, even though they're not in Southeast Asia, and neither are we, but they're our ride or die. So they're going to be in any alliance we form. But other Southeast Asian countries, um, Thailand... Uh, who else can I remember? New Zealand, Australia, which was basically more Great Britain at the time. But other Southeast Asian countries will all join uh, CETO. So now we have two and they have one. 
but that's not enough. We need to have even more than that. So we signed another one called CENTO, C-E-N-T-O, the Central Treaty Organization. And this is a treaty with uh, what was more of Western Asia, with Central, um, which really would be like the Middle East. So us and Pakistan and... Great Britain, obviously, because like I said, we can't do anything without them. Um, Israel, we all signed this new treaty, you know, promising each other, you know, prosperity and blessings and love and blah, 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 blah. So by the end of this, we are in a formal alliance with 42 different countries, which can be really dangerous. I mean, when you look back at World War One, alliances were a cause of how all of that went down. And so us getting into all of these alliances isn't necessarily a good thing. Now, while all this is happening and we're signing all these alliances and making all these pacts and friends, uh, one thing we feel like we definitely have at our advantage is our weapons technology. That We have the nuclear weapon, right? No one else has that. That is a trump card. You can't beat that. We have nukes. No one else does. Until we find out that that's not true and that we we get some intel letting us know that the Soviets have successfully produced and tested nuclear weapons. And so now uh, we don't have the biggest, baddest gun in the game, right? And if we were to use it against them, they would be able to use one against us. So we start building up not only our weapon supply, but our nuclear weapon supply. And if you look on this graph at the bottom right, you can see that blue line when it begins to curve up. In really like 1950, you see it start to rise, but like by 1955, it's just shooting straight up in the air. Those are our uh, missile productions, our missile buildups. So this is the beginning of the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union, which, as you can see, is going to last for a long time. Um, at its peak in, um, I would say, around, like, when we had probably the most combined was around 1975. Uh, when that happened, we collectively had enough nuclear weapons to blow up the planet, like, 200 times which is pretty, you know, useless. You blow it up once, you've done it, it's blown. Um, and this also leads us to something else called mutually assured destruction. If we use a nuclear bomb on Russia, what are they going to do? They're going to nuke us. So we assure our own destruction by using these nuclear weapons. So we're producing them with no real intention to ever use them. Both countries are just building up these massive weapon supplies as a, as a scare tactic that's not really working. It's just making the other country do the same thing. So this arms race is going to continue for a while, and we're going to see military spending continue to rise over the next, you know, 50 years.